Hey guys, my name's Thomas Busby and welcome back to part two of my series of Fujifilm's best lens for wildlife photography. Now this video is going to seem maybe a little bit complex, but I'm going to do my best to really simplify it down as much as possible. So if something's seeming over your head, stick with it, it'll get easier to understand and near the end of the video we'll compare the whole lot together. Now sharpness is a very touchy and interesting subject and before we get into worrying about what is the most absolute best performing lens from Fujifilm, I really need to stress some things. Sharpness requires far more than a good lens. It requires luck, knowledge and good light, a good subject, good skill. Everything else has far more of a factor than having that perfect lens. But in saying that, the reason we're doing all this so you know which lens to get to best suit you. Maybe you are a perfectionist, you want that little bit extra, or you just want to know how to get the absolute best out of the gear you already have. This video we're going to try and help share as much knowledge as we possibly can. Now this first lens we're going to take quite a bit of time with just to explain how this whole process is going to work but every lens after this first one will definitely bang through a little bit quicker. So if the first lens seems slow don't worry they're not all going to be like that. Plus if you'd like to jump to the part about your lens in particular maybe after watching the first one I'll leave little time code links down in the description below so you can just jump to the lens you care about most. But for the comparison at the end of the video, it would be good to know how all the lenses do it. So let's get into it. So first of all, to get the most out of a lens, you need to understand how diffraction works. And I think the easiest way to, to simplify it is as you increase the aperture of a lens, as in make it darker, go from f2.8 to f8 to f11, f16, etc. As you make that aperture darker, Think of it as starting to split your image over multiple pixels and so while you may increase your depth of field you get what's called diffraction and it will make your image actually look a little softer even though your depth of field has increased. So a big part to getting optimal image sharpness is known when you kind of meet that sweet spot of sharpness versus depth of field versus try not to cause too much diffraction. So to understand that let's look at how to get the best aperture out of a lens to start with. So looking at the cheap little XC50 to 230mm Mark II, we can see that it is sharpest at 50mm at f5.6, though at 230mm it is sharpest at f8. But as long as we keep the lens under f8, no matter what we zoom to, we should be pretty good. Now another complex thing is understanding MTF charts. Now these can be a little bit complex for some people to understand, but in, in a nutshell, sharpness, like when you see a sharp looking image, it is made up of two components. Contrast, and detail. If you don't have the contrast it will look unsharp and if you don't have the detail it will look unsharp. So once again with the XC50-230 to Mark II, to understand an MTF chart the left hand graph represents contrast and the right hand graph represents detail. The left hand side of the graph represents the middle of the lens and the right hand side represents the corners of the lens. Now for those of you who know how to read MTF charts already, you know why there are two lines. But to keep things simple, I've translated it over to just one average line. And we are starting out with this lens because it is the only lens in the series where the contrast is anything but excellent. Yes, that was a spoiler for every other lens coming up in the series. The contrast on all Fuji lenses, aside from that 50 to 230, is phenomenal. So we're going to do a lot more focusing on the detail side of things from now on. But before we get into that, I need to talk to you about expectations. See, the internet loves to convince you that you need the sharpest possible lens possible to get a phenomenal result. And to be honest, in part, this series doesn't help with that. But you do not. With, like I said, skill, editing, good light, good luck, a good subject, you can get a phenomenal, a perfect image. And so just starting out with a very good starting point, I reckon it is good enough. You don't want a bad lens, it's nice not to have an average lens, but as long as your lens is considered very good or better, you can get perfect photos. So if we take this detail graph and show it like we're looking at the front of the lens, we see this. Now once again, I wouldn't use this as a guide to how sharp your photos will be, but more of how accurate you need to be to get the lens to make your subject as sharp as possible. And as you can see with the XC50-230 to Mark II, we can be pretty forgiving with accuracy as all but the extreme edges give fantastic results. So now that we have a little bit of an understanding of how to read the charts I'm going to show you, we're going to dive in and I'm really going to bombard you with all the different lenses. And like I said, at the end we are going to do a little bit of a comparison between the whole lot. So the 55-200 to unfortunately drops in sharpness the more you zoom. Though going wider and cropping isn't worth the increase in detail. At 200mm it hits its peak at f8. As long as we stay under this, things will be sharp enough. 
Contrast drops off a little near the edges, though detail isn't fantastic unless you really nail your subject in the centre of your shot. And like I just said, this lens is still good enough to get a great image. The 55 to 200 will require you to push things pretty hard in editing if you want to get tack sharp looking images though. The 7300 isn't too much different from the 55 to 200. It does its best under f11, and its quality drops just a little the more you zoom, but once again it's not worth shooting wider and cropping in later just to try and get more detail. Its contrast is fantastic, but at 300 its detail is actually pretty low across all the lenses we are looking at today. So more than good enough to get a good image, but its performance out of this whole series at 300mm is low, though do still know at its dead centre it will give its best results. The 100-400 follows the same trend as every other lens, as its quality drops the closer to that 400mm mark we get, but when it comes to wildlife you're pretty safe keeping your aperture as bright as possible when using this lens. Detail is excellent in the centre, though drops off hard and fast near the middle of the lens, making the 100-400 more than any other lens really require to you to make sure you get your subject in the centre of your shot when trying to maximise detail. But don't let the contrast of colours concern you, the yellow areas can still be pushed to an excellent level of detail in post-production. Pleasantly surprising, the 200mm is a fantastic wide open, and it stays very sharp until about that f5.6, f8 range. Contrast is near perfect, though detail isn't as high I would like for a lens of this price, but massive credit is given to the consistency of the glass as it keeps truly outstanding results all the way across the frame, making accuracy and ease of shooting with the 200mm the best of the lot, and so it should be. Finally, onto the 50 to 140. Isn't as nice as the 200mm wide open, but it hits its peak around f5.6, f8, though it still gives fantastic results at f2.8. But where this lens really shines is in its dead centre detail, giving the best results of any lens in this group. And while it doesn't quite hold on as well as the 200mm across the glass, it is still an amazingly fantastic lens as far as accuracy required goes. Now I know that was all a little bit to take in, but let's compare it all and see how we can translate this down even more. So to help give a better understanding of what these coloured circles mean, I've added a numerical value to each one out of 100 to give an idea of detail. And to summarise, the more you spend and the less zoom you have, the better your results will be, which is kind of counter and pro-productive, like it's nice to spend less but we want more zoom, so that's a little contradictory nearly in a way. The 7300 is good, but I'm going to touch back on this lens in a moment. The XC50-230 Mark II did fantastic for how old and cheap it is. The 100-400 for its zoom rocks, though you do need to get your subject dead centre. The 200mm is outstanding, but don't forget its price and that it's only 200mm. And the 50 to 140 ranks highest, but with three major notes. Number one, these numbers are based on max zoom, not the whole range of the lens. Number two, when working out these values, more weight was given towards the middle of the lens, reducing in weight the further from the centre we get. Without a teleconverter, I wouldn't even consider the 50 to 140 a great wildlife lens, and a teleconverter is going to drop this score. So while the 200mm edges are better, the 50 to 140 centre is better, hence why it gets a higher score. And speaking of teleconverters, it's going to be real interesting to see how the 200mm or the 2 times teleconverter competes against, say, the 100 to 400 without a teleconverter. Does that even things up a little bit? Or how well is that, or how poorly is that 50 to 140 going to do once it's got that 1.4 2 times teleconverter pulling it back a little bit? But if I could end this video on one major point, is that we love to stress how important sharpness is. And while some of you might be a little concerned with how low the 70 to 300, especially given how new it is, has scored as far as that sharpness goes, it's still a very good lens. All these lenses are very good. None of them are average, none of them are bad, and none of them are what I consider excellent. It is very hard to make a high zoom sharp lens, and all of these are very good. And if you'd like to increase the quality of your images from very good to excellent, Learn skill, get good light, find an engaging subject and learn how to edit correctly. All of that, you can add an extra 10, 20 points to your shots to get it up to closer to that 100, that perfect, technically perfect image. So while this series and this episode especially seems to put so much technical weight on sharpness, it's not what it used to be. All lenses are phenomenal, all do a fantastic job. What I'm trying to share here is also the best knowledge of whatever gear you have or whatever gear you decide to get to help you get the best possible results you can and help you get closer to that 100 score with your final results.
So if you haven't already guys, please hit that subscribe button as next week we look into autofocus speeds. We are going to dabble a little bit into the Tully converter side of it, but that's going to be the week after. If you'd like to support more what I do here, feel free to head over to my website and consider buying a print. Or if financially you're not in that kind of situation, just like, share and subscribe. It always means the world to me guys. But otherwise, until next time, I'll catch you next time.